Okay, we would like to welcome you to the Center for Bioethics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. My name is Dr. Ashley Fernandez. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Bioethics and I am pleased to introduce, honored to introduce, Donal Umahuna, who is a senior lecturer in ethics, decision making, and evidence in the School of Nursing at Dublin City University. He's also on the faculty of the Biomedical Diagnostics Institute and the Institute of Ethics at Dublin City University. He's a fellow for the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignities Academy of Fellows and chairperson of the DCU Research Ethics Committee and the ethicist at St. James Hospital on the Dublin Ethics Committee. He earned his BS in pharmacy from Trinity College in Dublin, a PhD in medicinal chemistry from The Ohio State University, and after this, obtained a Master's of the Arts in Theology from Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio. He is the author and editor of numerous books, dozens of peer-reviewed publications, and is an international scholar on disaster ethics. We are pleased to welcome him for his talk, Disaster Research Ethics, Developing Evidence Ethically. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Ashley, and uh, thank you to the World Association for Disaster and, um, and Emergency Medicine for asking me to give this uh, webinar and seminar, and for Ohio State University for um, having the, uh, the seminar here present before a, a live audience. Um, it is a, a great privilege for me to, to be back at, uh, at Ohio State University, where I spent uh, my, my graduate school years. Um, and I really have changed in my uh, kind of focus of research since uh, being here in the, the College of Pharmacy and uh, having very much a bench science sort of focus. Um, but through uh, my, my training in, in theology and um, also in uh, the way that my kind of career has uh, developed, um, this area of looking at uh, research ethics has become a major focus for me and uh, specifically for today's topic, looking at the area of research um, around disasters. Um, the uh, whole area um, of disasters is obviously of uh, increasing attention these days. Um, I'm using the definition of disaster as put out by the UN office that has um, a, uh, a focus on disaster risk reduction which is that of a, a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or a society at any scale due to hazardous events interacting with conditions of exposure, vulnerability, and capacity in one or more of the following uh, material, human, economic, and environmental losses and impact. And part of the uh, distinctive aspect of a disaster is often that local capacity to respond is often um, uh, overwhelmed or completely destroyed in some cases, which will often require external assistance, which may mean looking to the uh, state, looking to federal government for help, or one country looking to another country. And this often is the source of some of the ethical challenges around uh, disaster response and disaster research when you may have people from very different cultures coming together, different priorities, different perspectives on, on how to address the disaster, the research, the uh, ethical aspects that, that arise. Um, the frequency of disasters uh, is uh, on the increase by um, most of the, the measures that have been put into place. There is some debate over exactly how these should be measured and what counts as a disaster. Uh, but in many of the categories, you definitely see a trend towards a greater number of these events um, that is leading to greater interest in both prevention of disasters and then also response to them. At the same time, um, there is a, a kind of an up and down dimension to uh, the impact that disasters are having. Uh, clearly there is um, a huge impact in the toll of people uh, being killed, the, the costs of the uh, impact uh, in both economic and human terms. And because of this there are various different organizations from 
uh, national and local uh, bodies all the way up to international organizations looking at responses to disasters. Where today's uh, uh, topic is going to engage more uh, directly with disasters is in the question that comes up about how to respond to disasters. What really are the best interventions to, to, uh, to take? And part of the, the challenge at the moment is that there is really an awful lot that isn't known in this particular area. Um, the DFID is uh, kind of the, the major UK uh, funder of disaster response and coordinator. Um, and in a, a, a report that they commissioned uh, looking at this whole area, they pointed out the lack of uh, evidence, the lack of knowledge in terms of what exactly is going to be the best way to respond uh, to people in disasters. As the report says, we really don't know which interventions are most effective in reducing risk, saving lives, and rebuilding livelihoods after crises. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that uh, these uh, slides are going to be available afterwards for anybody who wants to take down the details of uh, the different reports that I'll be mentioning throughout the uh, the presentation. Um, the result then is that a lot of humanitarian responding um, and which includes uh, disaster responding is often based on poor information and this puts uh, responders in a very difficult place where they may not know exactly what is the best thing to do or how to uh, treat or how to set up programs ahead of time that will best alleviate the, the people that are impacted by disasters. Um, the UN's uh, agency, UNISDR, uh, that uh, coordinates uh, major international disaster uh, risk reduction, uh, po has pointed out that much of the existing operational research related to emergencies and disasters lacks consistency, is of poor reliability and validity, and is of limited use for establishing baselines, defining standards, making comparisons, or even tracking trends. And so this is uh, part of the issue behind uh, the uh, debates that go on about whether or not all of the types of disasters are actually increasing or not. The impact of all of this uh, is that then responders are placed in very difficult uh, situations. Um, the failure to generate and use evidence in policy and response makes disaster or makes humanitarian action less effective, less ethical, and less accountable. And with the increased uh, call uh, for greater accountability, for greater um, ethical and effective responses to disasters, there is a need to generate more evidence and therefore to do more research. Um, as the DFID report says, it's unethical to deliver interventions that are at best not proven, are ineffective, or worse still, actually do harm. And there have been situations where uh, the traditional approach to disaster response or caring for people, particularly with the uh, uh, traumatic types of um, situations that can, uh, or traumatic um, injuries that can occur, uh, there has been uh, approaches that have since been shown to really not be effective and actually to be more harmful than other approaches that uh, are, are now available. Um, now part of the situation in terms of the, the challenge these days is that some practitioners in disaster response and in the humanitarian world believe that research uh, in disasters can actually be unethical. Um, and the concern here is that it often takes away from what should be the primary focus, where their concern is often that, you know, what we need around here are not people with clipboards and experimental drugs, but more people to dig people out of the, the, the rubble um, or to come in with water and food and uh, warm clothing, not something that you want to do research on. And what my presentation is going to focus on is that actually there are uh, kind of two sides to the coin, that there are two issues that need to be balanced here, and that ethics um, and evidence have got to be held uh, in, in, uh, in balance, but both of them must be promoted in order to give the, the best types of responses to disaster victims. 
one example that I'll pick, and there, uh, there are many that could be brought up, where if we stay in the current or in the situation where the evidence is not available, um, that we end up with uh, uh, really difficult or unethical situations, and that uh, well carried out research can actually be done ethically and also provides a very important service to the people um, that are, are uh, being taken care of. Um, in the aftermath of our, in, in Haiti, if, uh, I'm sure you're aware, in 2010, uh, they had a devastating uh, earthquake that led to uh, huge injuries, uh, a lot of destruction, um, and also a huge international response uh, to, uh, to the disaster, uh, leading to a lot, of, in, uh, a lot of aid arriving, and one of the types of aid were various surgical teams uh, to try to help the, uh, the people who had uh, terrible uh, limb injuries. In, uh, the, in the kind of uh, analysis and assessment of that disaster response, a lot of questions were raised about whether the response was actually done well or not, and uh, various criticisms have been made about different factors of the response. But one of the areas that has been highlighted is the uh, the surgeries that were done on people with very uh, severely injured limbs that uh, in some situations led to the um, uh, response teams carrying out amputations. But as the analysis was going deeper, it was discovered that there were very different uh, rates of uh, use of amputation among different teams. And these teams have uh, since been, um, or research has been carried out on these teams, on the patients that they took care of. And even allowing for some of the differences in the times of when uh, the various teams were in place, there is a huge divergence in the uh, rate of amputation among different teams. Um, in, uh, in one analysis, uh, similar teams in, Hi in Haiti at uh, similar times taking care of similar types of patients um, had rates of amputation anywhere between 1% and 45%. And so further research was carried out uh, to figure out what, what was leading to some of this, uh, this, these discrepancies. And in many cases, it simply had to do with the, uh, the ethos and the training of the different teams that went in there and to different presumptions that were made about whether amputation was the only uh, intervention that was uh, practical, feasible, and, and warranted. Uh, this research also highlighted that in many cases, records were not being kept at all. It's challenging to keep records in the first place in any type of a disaster, but that there was uh, a, a presumption that we, you know, there was even there was no need to keep even the most preliminary types of uh, records among some uh, responders, and there were allegations brought up of what became known as disaster tourism, uh, where some responders were more interested in being kind of seen uh, to respond and to be there and to have photographs taken in the, the midst of helping uh, in, the, uh, in the terrible situation, rather than actually complying with guidelines or really figuring out what exactly was, was most needed. So as a result of research of various types, retrospective studies for the most part, uh, but both uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, research, uh, interviewing both responders, uh, the uh, organizers, and uh, patients and community members, uh, different things have been put into place now where the World Health Organization developed and published minimum standards uh, for surgical interventions in disasters. And then just a couple of months ago, a training manual has been published by a joint initiative between uh, the International Red Cross, WHO, and uh, the AO Foundation, um, an international uh, surgical uh, professional organization. And so what is now available are general guidelines to assist those who go into disaster situations to show where there are uh, clear ways that you can know whether surgery is warranted or not, that there are principles that need to be highlighted that are supported by the best available evidence at the mo that exists at the moment, and that uh, hopefully there will be a more consistent approach in the future now 
rather than relying on the traditions or what various teams presume to be the right approach to deal uh, with uh, traumatic limb uh, injuries. So I think this highlights that there is an, a need, a dual imperative uh, to develop evidence that is going to assist responders um, and also planners for those uh, uh, engaged with disaster risk reduction planning. Um, and that this research uh, is, uh, needs to be carried out to the highest um, uh, methodological standards, but at the same time there's a need to engage with the ethical aspects so that, for example, uh, research is not going to uh, take priority over caring for the immediate needs of the responders, but that all of these um, ethical uh, considerations and imperatives are held in balance by various approaches to um, organizing the initiatives and the, uh, and the research. What is starting to develop now are a number of research ethics frameworks uh, to guide researchers who want to develop the type of evidence that's needed to guide uh, the responders. Um, I'm going to refer most uh, kind of frequently to the most uh, recent uh, set of guidelines that's just been issued at the end of 2016 uh, by the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences. Um, their set of guidelines is about 60 years old now and continues to be revised as new issues, new contexts come up for um, any type of health-related research involving humans. But there are other um, ethical frameworks, uh, one from the UK, uh, an organization called R2HC, which funds uh, disaster research. Um, Doctors Without Borders has uh, an ethics review board with uh, guidelines for any of their members doing research and disasters. Um, and uh, the working group mentioned there is one that are developed after uh, the tsunami of 2004, uh, where um, this group of uh, Asian researchers has put together a really um, clear set of guidelines for research happening in that area. Um, what sort of research? I think obviously medical research is going to uh, find itself most closely aligned with the uh, COIMS guidelines. Um, but uh, one of those guidelines hi highlights that there's a need for uh, research of a whole variety of different types and that the ethical aspects of all of that type of research needs to be developed. I've been doing some work recently on qualitative research that's done in the area of disasters and uh, there's a real lack that the uh, researchers themselves admit to uh, in terms of guidelines to be provided for that particular type of research. So there's a need that even as the, the medical guidelines are starting to develop, there's a need for uh, other areas of research to really engage with developing these sorts of guidelines. Because the issue is that in a disaster, there are all sorts of different uh, types of evidence that are going to be needed for different aspects of the response and uh, the planning. So that qualitative interviews are going to be of, uh, of best um, value for certain types of questions, whereas randomized controlled trials are going to be the need to the best to address other types of questions. And so this part of, uh, of the um, issue is something that has to be addressed then by taking into account the, uh, the types of research questions that are, are most needed. Uh, there was a lot of debate uh, during the Ebola uh, crisis and the response to it in terms of what type of design, research design was needed. Uh, the COIMS uh, guidelines um, have uh, I think come out with acknowledging that there is a need to explore alternative trial designs that they, they put this into the commentary on their new guideline um, so that uh, there may be some challenges with doing a classic randomized controlled trial in a disaster setting which requires some sort of modified trial design so that um, there is an acknowledgement that different trial designs may be needed in a, in a disaster context However, they do point out as well that the methodological and the ethical merits of alternative trial designs must be carefully assessed before these designs are used. 
Uh, so there's a need for more work on the methodology side of things to ensure that the evidence is going to be the best type for the types of research that's going to be um, undertaken. What I want to do uh, to look at some examples of the issues that can come up in disaster research and ways that it can be addressed is use a framework that um, was published about um, uh, 12 years ago. Um, it sets out a set of uh, benchmarks uh, for ethical research. Uh, these are, are particularly focused on developing countries. Uh, there was a, an, an earlier version uh, focused on developed countries. But I think there are many different ways that you could organize the types of ethical issues that come up in disaster research. And I just want to use this framework as a, as a, a way to organize these and to highlight some of the issues. There are many, many different types of uh, dilemmas that come up. Any one of these could take up a whole lecture's focus. Um, and so it's just going to be a very broad stroke of some of the uh, typical issues that can come up and some examples of ways that have been proposed to address these. So these are the, uh, the eight benchmarks that uh, Emmanuel and colleagues uh, have brought up. And I'll just go through each one of them fairly briefly. Possibly one of the key issues that may not be as big an issue outside of disaster research or research in, uh, involving low and middle income countries is the key role that collaborative partnership plays uh, in developing the research but also in addressing the ethical issues. Uh, this, I think, takes the form of a need to engage with local communities at all stages of the research from the design to the implementation to the dissemination. In the past, there has been a, a, an assumption that a research project can be designed you know, here in our normal settings in a well-resourced uh, developed country, and then we can just bring it over to any location and implement it. And some of the major ethical challenges that have arisen when that type of an assumption was taken and then you get into a different culture, a different context, such as the middle of a disaster, and find out that things can't work in certain ways, or that the values and the, uh, the ethical principles that are cherished in other cultures are not put in the same priority as those that uh, would be the case in a developed country. Um, so, this uh, has led to an increased focus on the need to engage with local communities right from the beginning. This can certainly be a challenge with disasters where an earthquake may hit where you know, nobody has been thinking about doing a research project. Um, and yet it sets up a, a need to engage with local people um, as the project is put into effect um, as soon as possible or if, it is there, if there's a plan to go to uh, a low-income country, that people from those sorts of contexts would be involved in the design and in the discussions around the, uh, the project when it is being planned ahead of times. Um, part of the issue here is that uh, some of the, um, um, the ethical issues uh, can be anticipated and need to be planned for before getting out into the field and starting to think, oops, here's, here's a problem that's been developed um, or that, that we hadn't thought about beforehand. As uh, Goodhand says, the most appropriate decisions are likely to be made when ethical issues are thought about prior to starting research. Researchers are most likely to do harm when they do not anticipate likely ethical challenges. And I think this is moving away from what can sometimes be the assumption of, of some researchers that ethics starts when we need to go through the ethical approval process or to go to the IRB and get, get their approval. Um, and this acknowledges the, that, that that was never intended to be the case, uh, but that shouldn't be the case because then there may not be a, a time or a way for the ethical issues to actually lead to changes in the design if that's really the best way to address the ethical challenges. So these the importance of collaborative partnership starts at the beginning. It means that uh, people and communities from the places where the research will be conducted need to be consulted. 
It also means that ethical approval may be needed not only at home, but also in the locations where the project is to be implemented. This again can be very challenging in, uh, in a disaster setting, but it may be that the Ministry of Health in that country that's been impacted can be engaged with to explain the project to if there isn't an actual um, ethics committee to, to give approval. But that again, engagement with the, the local uh, procedures that uh, can best be implemented is the, the key thing here. The second benchmark is the social value and this again I think should be a, a normal consideration but it addresses one of the concerns of those that raise ethical questions about disaster research um, as a whole and the SIAMS guidelines make this uh, very clear saying that the first and foremost obligation in acute disaster situations is to respond to the needs of those affected. So there needs to be a question asked about whether this is the best time to do this research project. Are the, the, uh, the responses to the immediate injuries much more important right now than implementing the, the research uh, project? Um, but with the consideration that there also needs to be some way of evaluating whether this particular um, uh, intervention has enough evidence to help us know if it really is the best thing to be um, implementing. Again, this is another area where engaging with the local population is very key because the social value to a local population may not be the same as that for a researcher coming from a different continent, a different uh, socioeconomic background. And so learning about what are those, uh, th those needs in the local situation, what is it that people most want uh, researchers to be able to provide them evidence about. It may not be uh, the latest uh, you know, treatment or new drug that is going to help with the illness. It may have much more to do with uh, injustices that exist in the area or to um, addressing different ways that different people are not able to access any health care. Um, and so again, it's important to engage um, with the local population to find out what really is um, of value. The question of scientific validity is another uh, debated issue. Um, a lot of people would uh, claim that uh, the scientific validity is not part of what an ethics evaluation should be about. And yet, if the validity of a study is not there, then it uh, can be ethically questionable to be doing it in the first place. Um, again, there needs to be a, a realization that all types of research, even ones that are not giving uh, dangerous new drugs that may have unexpected side effects, can likewise cause different types of harm in a different sort of way. Even approaching people as a Westerner in some situations can be enough to put people at risk if they are thought to in some way uh, be collaborating with, uh, with outsiders or, or things like that. And so it's really important to evaluate uh, the, the way the research is being done and uh, checking that it is the most valid approach to, uh, to carrying out uh, the uh, addressing the research question. There needs to be an examination of whether the study is feasible. It may be designed very well, have all sorts of validity, but if it's just not feasible to do it in that setting, then uh, the initiation of it and using resources towards it would be really questionable. Is there funding available for all phases of the uh, study? It's not enough to just do the study and have all the data in your uh, filing cabinet or on your, uh, your laptop. Um, and not have any way then to, uh, to get it disseminated because there isn't funding there, there's no funding to pay for people to continue on the project, to write it up properly. All of these types of things need to be uh, fed into the, the discussions. And then there's also a need to ensure that the researchers involved um, are going to have the necessary training and support. In a disaster situation, there may often be uh, a a need uh, to uh, hire or to engage with local researchers or, or local uh, responders and ask them to become field researchers for the project. 
Um, and in this case, it's very important to ensure that they receive the necessary training to be able to uh, carry out the, the research uh, scientifically, but also to address the ethical dilemmas. Because as Molyneux and colleagues say, as is often the case in research, many of the ethical dilemmas and challenges were unexpected and faced only once the field work had begun. And so their uh, report talks about the way that uh, they included um, a time of uh, ethical reflection with all of their uh, field workers on a regular basis and that they brought up uh, ethical challenges that they hadn't really considered. Um, in one case, for example, uh, the researchers brought up that they, um, were, they were looking at how uh, women provided for uh, the, the food needs of their children and uh, one of the uh, women reported to the field worker that, uh, that she often uh, sold herself for sex in order to, um, or, or had sex with other men in the, in the village in order to, to get money to buy food. The researcher had uh, assumed there was no need to uh, report this, that this would be more like gossiping. But when they talked it through with the research team, they realized this is a very important piece of information to document, uh, to document carefully, uh, but to include in the report. And they were then able to make sure that all of the field workers were actually bringing back more controversial or questionable types of, um, of things and not just writing them out of their, of their data because they assumed these, uh, these were gossip and, and not important. Another area is, that's really important is to have a, a, a post-research analysis of just how well did the project go, both methodologically and ethically. And I'm part of a project that's just getting started next month where we're going to be interviewing uh, researchers, uh, ethics committees, and uh, uh, research participants to find out what sorts of ethical issues came up in various projects uh, that these, so that uh, as opposed to simply the ones that were thought about ahead of time during ethical approval, so that everybody can learn from the actual dilemmas that arose rather than just the ones that uh, were anticipated to possibly arise. Fair subject selection is very important, and uh, this again reflects um, on the need to engage with local communities because what may be perceived as fair from an external researcher's view may not be the same as that from uh, within uh, the, the local community. In a recent systematic review of all sorts of disaster research ethics guidelines found that the vulnerability of participants was one of two key themes, uh, core themes, that were brought up in these uh, different um, guidelines about this area. So how to engage with the vulnerabilities of those who are going to be participants is a, is a key and well-recognized issue. But one group of, real, of researchers realized that um, uh, when they talked with um, residents of refugee camps um, and other uh, camps for displaced uh, people due to other dis types of disasters, that the uh, tendency had been to go to the leaders uh, to engage in interviews with, the, uh, with researchers. But when these researchers then went to other members of the, the camp who weren't in a leadership position, they um, uncovered a lot of, um, kind of uh, uh, problems in the data that was being collected. Because as they were told in these quotes here, that the researchers come in, they talk to the leaders and their, their wives, but they never hear about what it's actually like um, in the camps. Um, or that the, uh, the, the leaders don't give the, uh, the ordinary people in the camps um, any justice, but then they're the ones that the UN High Commission for Research for Refugees listen to. So again, if vulnerable groups are not being uh, listened to in research projects, there's a huge amount of missing information that may help to give a much better picture so that uh, deciding to leave out people simply because they're vulnerable can often create other ethical problems. So it, it creates a, a challenge to uh, address this whole area in a, in a proper way. And part of the challenge is that there can be various risks uh, that may not be anticipated 
um, even if people are assuming there's a benefit of better information. Um, for example, there can be risks related to the participant group that the researchers want to engage with, where, uh, for example, in that last uh, situation, if the leaders of, uh, of a community were uh, distrustful of the rest of the members of the community, then those other members could be um, in some way uh, harmed afterwards as a result of having talked with the researchers. Um, methods themselves, if, uh, if they kind of uncover uh, previous trauma, can that generate other challenges for the participants? But there's also risks to researchers that need to be examined. Asking researchers to go into disaster zones puts them um, at the very least at some uh, uh, physical risk if it's an unstable geological situation. But if there's also a conflict or war going on, then that puts the researchers at other types of risks and therefore those need to be carefully incorporated, which may not be the case when you're doing a, a, a research study in a, in a peacetime, well-resourced uh, context. Um, the principle of reciprocity and benefit sharing is increasingly recognized and this is where there needs to be some value to the community that is returned to them. So it could be where uh, if a new drug is developed as a result of experiments done in that community, that that drug will be available at a, an affordable cost or, or for, for no charge in uh, that community later on. Or it could be that if people are going to risk disclosing stories of injustice um, or um, any type of coercion going on, that, uh, that those reports will make it to the authorities who are actually going to, to hopefully be able to make some, some change. But when you talk about having direct benefits to others, this can set up other challenges. It can be um, from you know, uh, relatively uh, minor uh, challenges where one study uh, looking at the uh, uh, provision of, or of how families cope with, uh, with hunger and lack of food, um, the researchers decided that for every family that would get involved with the, um, with the project, they would give them a day's, food, a day's supply of food as a kind of payment for the time that it took to engage with the, with the researchers. Um, but it turned out that this became the source of a lot of um, mistrust and uh, um, uh, disagreement and even conflict within the community because the people who decided not to sign up to be participants were very envious of the other families that were getting uh, the food. Uh, in, in this particular case, the study went on over several months, so it happened on a fairly regular basis within, uh, within the, the families. So that can be a, a you know, a, fairly ordinary type of thing that may not be anticipated where uh, researchers are thinking this is going to be a, a good way for us to give some benefits and yet it may backfire in some other ways when the larger social um, situation, isn't, situation isn't appreciated. Um, this I think, cartoon captures in a, in a light way uh, that you know there is a, in a disaster setting there is what's become known as the humanitarian misconception where people may agree to do all sorts of different things because they're in such huge need that they may believe mistakenly that if they don't become research participants then they're not going to get any aid from uh, the, these the various teams from outside and so it, it creates a real challenge to make sure that the fact that uh, research participation is not going to be a requirement in order to get the aid and other things that are happening. Independent review is probably well uh, recognized. Um, it is important to identify various types of conflicts of interest. In disaster settings, this is particularly the case where there may be uh, other organizations around or where the researchers may either be actually part of these groups or associated with them where uh, there may be perceptions that uh, engaging with the research is somehow uh, furthering other military, political, commercial, religious ideas um, or goals. Um, there is a need to balance the fact that in a research, in a disaster situation, there's an urgent need to get to the site, whereas uh, ethical reflection and, and uh, approval 
may need to be much slower and methodical. Uh, the SIOMS guidelines have acknowledged that there needs to be a, an increased flexibility that hasn't been there in some research ethics committees and IRB procedures. Um, and so they've been calling for new and innovative approaches. For example, uh, one uh, method that's now becoming more acceptable is that a uh, research uh, uh, approval process can be engaged with where the ge general parameters of the project are laid out uh, but without the actual specific site so that as soon as the disaster hits the details of that site can be put into the project it's already received a very thorough uh, pre-approval and now it can be implemented on an expedited uh, approval process knowing that uh, a lot of the details have already been worked out in the, in the past. Um, informed consent is a, the, the kind of the standard for uh, research ethics and this uh, continues. The SIOMS guideline says that there's no reason to think that just because it's a disaster that there's no need to collect individual informed consent. Uh, unless um, accepted standards for those waivers uh, would, uh, would be involved. But it is a huge ca challenge that I think is reflected by this one researcher's um, quote, uh, when I go into a horrendous camp situation as a white researcher, the people are so desperate for any form of assistance, they would agree to anything just on the off chance that I might be able to assist. It makes asking for permission to interview them or take photographs a farce. And so it is a huge challenge um, that has led to different uh, approaches to try to address, uh, one of which I'll mention in a second here, um, because of it ties in more clearly with the, uh, the eighth aspect and the, the last one of this uh, set of benchmarks, the importance of promoting respect for participants and communities. Um, privacy and confidentiality obviously must be protected. Uh, but uh, in situations this has not happened. Um, the uh, research by Pitaway and colleagues um, uh, led to a number of statements from um, the participants that other researchers had stolen their stories, where they had come in, done interviews, heard about some of the terrible things that, uh, that they had gone through, and then the researchers took off, never heard from them again, uh, never sent any acknowledgement of gratitude to say thank you for opening up about uh, these difficult things um, or even not even uh, consulting them about uh, you know, where these uh, results would be disseminated, how they might actually lead to changes for, uh, for those people. And so there are basic issues of just courtesy and grat expressing gratitude that need to be incorporated into the, uh, the, the whole research process. There is a, a method that I think um, highlights some ways that people can be respected, that informed consent can uh, meet the challenges of disaster settings. And this, <clears throat> this method has been called, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, I just need to get a drink of water. So these researchers, by engaging with um, the community of the participants over a number of months, were able to develop trust to where the participants and their whole community understood exactly what was happening, exactly what the research project involved. They were able to give feedback to make changes. And then these researchers found out that instead of the conventional wisdom that women do not talk about sexual abuse in some of these um, difficult situations, that actually these women were very happy to talk about things in the hope that uh, changes and improvements could be made. But the key to all of this, I think, has been that respecting participants, engaging with them and their communities has been a key um, ethical principle that has led to developments in the methodology and thus with that original seesaw I was talking about promoting both the evidence and improving that and also promoting uh, ethical uh, uh, values. So in conclusion I just want to say a couple of things 
what about the, the general approach here. I think codes and guidelines have limitations and this is only just starting to be acknowledged even though points have been made about this over decades. Um, as some social science researchers pointed out, that codes and guidelines, if they're taken as the way to deal with ethics, that these can actually undercut the sense of personal accountability and the importance of personal integrity, where it becomes more important to tick a box than to be able to say, well, I actually am being honest here, or that I'm actually taking care and respecting these participants, as opposed to, well, I've got an informed consent form that's been signed. In 1966, Henry Beecher reviewed clinical research at the time, and he pointed out that informed consent was really key to ethical research, but he actually said that a second factor was more important, the presence of an intelligent, informed, conscientious, compassionate, responsible investigator. And that is, a, I think, a, a really important aspect and yet a very challenging dimension to research ethics. This was highlighted in a report that the U.S. President's uh, Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues uh, brought out looking at a, a previous type of research done in the 50s which uh, was, was really horrifically unethical. But they pointed out, again, the need for not just codes and guidelines but virtuous researchers, a focus on the internal ethical motivation of individual investigators not only the rules and regulations that externally motivate in, uh, investigators towards compliance. And this, I think, is going to be a huge challenge for all areas of uh, research ethics. Now, we need to have all researchers engaging with the need to identify ethical issues, to be able to reflect on them and be able to, to defend uh, their ethical decisions, especially in disaster settings where the researcher may be out in the field on their own and not able to dialogue with the team in ways that they might otherwise have to. And so that means that they need also, in addition to the skills, they have to become changed as to become virtuous researchers themselves, that they hold to the highest levels of personal and research integrity. Training for this is going to be challenging um, and assessment even uh, more challenging. But I think if we don't take this approach, that then when researchers are tempted to do something that's less than fully ethical, um, they really are only going to have their own conscience and their own virtues to grapple with. And so if they haven't developed these areas, these habits of the heart of, of being virtuous and being ethical, then it's going to be a lot easier to succumb to the temptation to cut a little corner here or to uh, kind of uh, shave a bit off the ethical standards and instead they'll need to commit to continuing to uphold the highest ethical standards. So I'll stop there at this point and I'm happy to open it up for uh, questions. There will be a way now that uh, questions can be written in for those of you online and uh, then also um, people in the audience can ask questions and I'll uh, restate the question so that uh, the um, people online can pick that up. So, um, would anybody like to start with the first question? Yes. Um, uh, virtuous researchers. I think that there can be different standards for what virtue is. Do you think that it's the responsibility of the international community to develop guidelines to how to develop those virtues, or if that's the responsibility of the researchers themselves? Okay, the question is about uh, kind of developing virtue, uh, uh, virtuous researchers. Is the responsibility for developing guidelines and standards on the, uh, the part of the international community or the researchers? And I would say that it's going to involve both, um, that it is, um, for example, those new surgical guidelines include um, a chapter on the need to develop ethical, uh, ethical decision-making skills um, as well as all of the surgical skills. And so that's coming from the international um, organizations. 
But in developing those guidelines, they used researchers, um, surgical surgeons, um, other professional organizations to engage with them because they are the ones who know what it's like on the ground. Um, and so I think the it's, it's going to have to involve all, and it's going to need, to, I think, to be a different type of training for researchers because um, you know it's need. I think it. Virtue really, I think, is developed kind of alongside people where you can see is, is this person being as accurate as possible? Are they being totally honest, uh, totally respectful? And so I think that's where um, researchers who are more senior will need to engage with the junior researchers and see this as part of the training that's going to be very important. And keeping in mind that like research happens all over the world um, and there are different cultural standards. So how do you guide and teach researchers to act virtuously um, and do this quickly enough in disaster situations? Yeah, the question is um, how would you kind of guide and train researchers um, in in the virtues, uh, you know, given the urgency of the, the disaster research? Is that um, well? I think again, this is where, uh, like with the research protocol, it shouldn't be developed once it comes on the news that the, there's an earthquake somewhere. Um, that it's something that needs to be built into the training of researchers all along. Um, and become part of research training. Um, and I think there's a, there is a, a, an increasing emphasis on this, usually under the term research integrity, uh, which tries to capture that you know, sort of research ethics is now associated more with ethical approval, but research integrity is about the, the skills and character of the, uh, the actual researcher. So it needs to be part of the ongoing training and I think also part of the kind of post-research reflection, um, you know, where there are situations where it just proved impossible to be, uh, let's say, totally honest, um, you know, I think that that can be a real challenge where somebody is committed to that, really believes in that, and yet you find yourself, especially in conflict situations, that, well, if I tell these people ex all the truth, then that's going to get somebody else into trouble. Um, and looking at ways of, of um, I guess, debriefing about those challenges after the project has been done as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you mentioned about disaster tourism and um, when those people, you know, come in and want to take pictures and want to do things that maybe aren't like Exactly. Yeah, the question is about the um, disaster tourism. Um, does does that negate the good that they may also be doing? I think it's it's a real challenge. I think it's it's not going to be easy in any situation to be 100% ethical and to always do only good and no harm. And disaster ethics, I think, really uh, is it's a, it's a messy world in the first place and you're never going to get a, a totally perfect ethical situation because of the very context you're in. So then the question is, if uh, some of the some of the study or some of the um, they're anecdotal, but they have been published, uh, were of people who were interfering with other surgery teams trying to do their work because they wanted a photo opportunity and had the press with them, and so there's that in say contrast to somebody who spends their whole, you know, 90% of their time doing surgery and then they happen to meet a reporter who wants to take a photograph of them. Um, and in that way, I think there's a place for um, making sure that the dominant motivation and the dominant use of time 
is around the needs of the moment. And it, it's, it's further challenged by the fact that one story that gets into the Western press could actually do a huge amount of good in terms of raising funds that will send more resources. So it's, it's not simple, um, but I think there are there's examples on both ends of the spectrum that are really good and really bad and trying to move uh, away from those bad situations is the, is the key thing. Yeah, Nick. How do you balance, um, in a lot of disaster situations, there isn't a lot of warning. And there's a need for information to be disseminated as quickly as possible. And I'll frame my question with the Ebola outbreak. Um, when one of the, the third US patient traveled through Cleveland Hopkins Airport, and the state of Ohio was really ramping up our efforts to treat patients with Ebola, but we needed information on personal protective equipment. What are the best ways to treat these patients? What do we do with waste? Are there ways you can expedite IRBs and ways to research this, these things without compromising ethics to get that information out to the people who need it? I, I just I fear that. Um, IRBs and informed consent can really impact the goal of disaster response, which is doing as much good for as many people as possible. Yeah. And I know that's kind of the crux of this talk, but um, I guess what I'm looking for is, are there tactics you can use to, to push this research through quicker or those types of things? Yeah, there's a question around the uh, the balancing between the need to collect information on disasters and the uh, methodical and kind of often slow approval process that can go into IRB uh, approval. And I think there, there there clearly is a tension there. And again, on the one hand, there's uh, a need to avoid poorly quickly put together research um, that just simply happens you know, when the report comes in of something. Um, but on the other hand, not being so methodical over the evaluation that the, that the window for collecting the information is gone before you get ethical approval. Um, so I think this is where there is some thinking going on in this whole area. Uh, Pre-approval is one approach. Um, I think the um, the MSF Ethics Committee has got a, a, a mechanism where uh, they will pre-approve protocols, um, but at the same time uh, they uh, it's a, they have an international um, membership to the committee, and they can be pulled together virtually um, in a in an urgent crisis to evaluate something when there really only are you know, maybe hours or a couple of days to, to actually get the uh, project running. Um, some funders are taking this approach as well. Um, the, the R2HC project or a funding agency that I mentioned that has their ethics committee, they now have uh, funded two projects, but they will only be implemented when a disaster hits. So the whole thing has been designed, uh, is, is ready to go. Uh, the funding is available to send people to do whatever, what they're going to do. But unlike traditional funding where you get the money and you, you implement it within a, you know, a set time frame, they're, they're allowing them to wait until the, the need arises to do the project. Um, so I, I think it's, it's People need to be getting creative, and I think IRBs are, are being challenged um, to find ways where, where they can do things differently to maintain the standards, um, but allow certain types of, of uh, urgent research to get done within that time frame. Um, and it's something that uh, another approach has been uh, kind of put forward is to have specialized disaster research IRBs that maybe would be a national committee or an international committee um, so that these uh, committees would be 
um, experienced in these projects and then realize that they need to be available to give, say, a full day to review a, a protocol because it needs to be implemented very quickly. I, I want to be sure to give our online audience some uh, time to, to respond. Um, Andrew, can you coordinate that? or I don't uh, see your questions right at the moment. Uh, can you hear me right now? I can, yes. Um, so I can open up questions from the remote audience. We have a few uh, people who have questions. Um, I'm just going to start in order. Uh, I have Rowena Christensen uh, from Australia. Uh, Rowena, I'm going to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. Go ahead, Rowena. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for a, for a really, really informative um, webinar. My, my question was thinking of students and new graduates in the health professions. Are there any primers on research ethics or bioethics that you would recommend for students to, to take a look at to try to uh, start them on the path towards becoming a virtuous researcher? Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Rowena, for your question. Um, just for the audience here, could, could you hear the question? Okay. She was asking about um, kind of uh, uh, primers and resources for students, student researchers um, that would look more at the, the, the virtuous uh, researcher approach to things. And I, I'm not aware of anything that takes an explicitly virtue approach to, uh, to research training. Um, but there certainly um, are research integrity guidelines, uh, which um, most international, most large countries have them. I, I know Australia does have one. Um, but these are, without explicitly mentioning virtues, they're really talking about the importance of training in, in honesty and uh, faithfulness um, to, to data, to, to participants. Um, and so they can be read in that way. But it's definitely something explicitly approaching it from a virtue end of things is, um, is, is something that uh, I think there really needs to be more work done on. Um, I, I think the other uh, approach uh, is really looking at their, they're now starting to develop within uh, global health ethics um, uh, programs uh, that there are uh, as part of the, uh, the research modules that those are making available that there is an increasing attention being given to, the, given to this um, and that that may be another resource to, to begin with. Is there another question, Andrew? We have uh, three or four more, so we'll try and go through them. Uh, the next person we have here is John Pringle, who I believe is in Canada. John, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Go ahead, John. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Donald. It's wonderful to hear you. I'm just sorry I can't see you online. Uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, a concern is that international humanitarian response is becoming more normalized, that is professionalized and medicalized, but that it leaves the root causes of disaster unaddressed. And I'm wondering your thoughts on whether disaster research has a tendency to overlook the conditions that lead to disasters and that don't examine the economic policies or public health austerity is that the root causes of disaster? Okay, thanks for that question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it is a, um, so for the audience in, uh, here, the question was, uh, does disaster research um, sometimes uh, avoid or ignore the deeper problems about why disasters happen in the first place? And I think this is a tension that, um, exists throughout disaster response with the engagement between acute responses and then the long-term development work uh, that may be going on prior to the uh, disaster happening or that is going to be needed after the disaster has happened. And there certainly is a tension there uh, because there, um, 
yeah, there's, there's, there's a, I, I think, clearly an acknowledgement that a lot of disasters these days happen in the middle of conflict and war. Uh, they often happen or are, have a, a massively increased impact because uh, the location is already one with a lot of poverty or poor infrastructure to begin with or uh, injustice uh, going on long term. Um, so it has been a problem, I, I know, where uh, all of a sudden in a, an impoverished area you have people coming from all over the world with all of the best equipment. They stay for a few weeks or months and then they go home and, uh, and people are, are put back into uh, the, you know, the pre-existing uh, problematic situation. I think it's, it's starting to be uh, at least acknowledged and discussed that acute responses can harm long-term development aid um, or development uh, developments. Um, and it also, I think, is starting to be acknowledged that, um, you know, just like uh, in a developed context, if you just, uh, you know, keep dealing with the emergencies but don't deal with the underlying root problems, that you're just going to be putting more and more money into dealing with the acute issue and you have to, at the same time, find ways to address the underlying chronic situations. So it's, it has not been developed or uh, examined and acknowledged to the degree that it needs to be, but that is starting to happen and I think, like with most things, it's really, it's, it's going to need both approaches to deal with, uh, to, to provide research that will address the underlying problems, the underlying causes, um, ensure that long-term solutions are put into place while also dealing with the, the urgent situation that requires an acute response. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. It's a, it's a really important issue. Okay, we have a few more questions. Do you, do you still have time? Uh, yes, I, I do. Our audience here, do you have to be somewhere now? <laughs> okay, yeah, we, we have the room for another uh, 10 minutes or so, so we can, I can continue. Okay, uh, we have a question from Deborah Cascardo, who I believe is also in Canada. I'm going to unmute your microphone, Deborah. If you're there, go ahead with your question. may have stepped away because I do see a um, indication that she's inattentive at the moment. We have one more here. We have Kem Jen, who is from Ethiopia. Uh, are you there? I unmuted your microphone. Uh, well, it appears we're having some uh, technical issues with the remote audience. Okay. Oh, okay, here we go. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you for the excellent presentation. And my question is, uh, yes, it is critical to have unproven interventions in disaster situations, but what if the situation forces us to do that? Um, is... Uh, and I'm just, is your question wondering, you know, why is it that we have unproven interventions? I mean, if the situation forces us, we can still use some unproven interventions. Oh, is it acceptable to, to use unproven interventions? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a real challenging question. I think we're... Um, where it is unproven and uh, the, uh, I think it, it, the first thing to look at is what, what's the, the reason or the evidence to think that uh, this intervention could be effective. And I think if there's good support for that, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, 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 an experimental treatment that hasn't made it through all of the, the research or if it's a, um, you know, a, um, um, uh, like a, a psychological intervention that there is some 
um, you know, report, uh, reports and some uh, preliminary evidence that it may be of benefit that the first thing is that there should be some good reason to believe that it is uh, likely to be effective and there should be some information as well on the um, on the potential harms or risks with it so that if those are, are relatively minimal um, then uh, there could be a, a good reason to go ahead uh, and then I would say that uh, when implementing an unproven intervention that it should be made known to the participants or to the uh, um, recipients that this is the, the, the status that it has, that uh, this is not the same as a well-proven uh, intervention, and that also then there should be a commitment to collecting outcome data at the same time as using it so that the evidence could start to be developed as to whether or not it is effective. Um, so that uh, it, uh, if it can't be implemented in a way that involves a research study, that at least there is some uh, good data accompanying it on the outcomes and any adverse effects that may have arisen when it was introduced. Good. Thanks for that question. That appears to be the uh, end of the questions from the remote audience. Is anything else from our live audience that has come up? Okay, well, I think uh, people have been with us for quite a while. Um, so I uh, will just uh, kind of wind things up. I'd like to thank you, Andrew, for the technical support, which uh, was really great. Um, and thank uh, the Ohio State University for hosting the seminar and the uh, people for coming along as part of the live audience and the international uh, web audience. So we'll close it up there and uh, I think as, uh, as I mentioned earlier all of this will be available um, online later on. Thank you.